Today I thought I would try something new in reacting to a couple of videos that have been put out there on YouTube stating that the Nintendo Switch 2 is going to be a failure. Now, I'm not saying that these YouTubers dislike the Nintendo Switch, although that might be the conclusion you have for one of them, but it is something that I thought would be fun to explore and discuss and reply to and do it in a way that I basically don't really do and I wanted to see if you guys really enjoy this sort of content, and maybe it's something we will do more often for other topics. Now, this isn't going to replace our news video today, but I just wanted to try and see what you guys thought. That being said, I want to remind you guys we're on our road to 150,000 subscribers, so I would appreciate it if you would drop a like, you know, maybe leave a comment down below on how you think about this video, and ring-a-ling that ding-a-ling so you can get notified of all of our videos. All right, this first video we see is coming from VK's channel. It says the Switch 2 is going to flop. Now, reminder, this was from a few months ago, so this is actually a couple weeks before Tears of the Kingdom, so they won't have the context of how well Tears of the Kingdom sold, although it shouldn't really change anything. Uh, so let's go ahead and listen to what he says, and we'll pause as we go here and respond. Hello, everyone. I believe that the successor for the Nintendo Switch is going to flop, and here's why. When Nintendo first released the Switch, that concept was unique. If you wanted to play your games on the go, you had only one option. But today, with each year, more and more portable devices pop up. And many of them already surpasses the Switch hardware. Most of them are even emulating Switch games better than the original console. So what's interesting here is he starts out by saying that if you wanted to play games on the go, Nintendo Switch was your only option back in 2017. I don't know if this guy's aware, but Nintendo has actually had handheld devices for way the hell longer than 2017. I mean, they literally launched the Game Boy in the 80s. So yeah, the 3DS was also a handheld video game. I'm not sure this person paid that much attention to that stuff. Also, by the way, the Tegra X1 chip that the Nintendo Switch uses was actually originally in the NVIDIA Shield, which was also a portable gaming device. People just didn't buy it. And we technically already had portable handheld PCs back then, but they were like $1,500, $2,000. So they were just really expensive and weren't taking off. But yeah, definitely this whole portable gaming, it's not new. It's new in the way that Nintendo made it seamless going from TV to handheld. That was sort of the newer feature. And even then, a dockable system you could take with you wasn't necessarily new. It just wasn't popularized. So it may not have a full history of what handhelds were actually doing back in 2017. Personally, I think this is karma hitting Nintendo back for releasing a console with a weak hardware. Let okay, uh, we hear this all the time that the Nintendo Switch has weak hardware. Can we just be frank and honest about the weak hardware statement? Back in 2017, Nintendo Switch was the most powerful dedicated gaming handheld device in the world that wasn't some $2,000 plus dollar experimental thing on uh, you know, Kickstarter or whatever. So, yeah, it was actually extremely good hardware back then for the form factor they were in. You got to consider form factor anytime you talk about power. Obviously, handhelds are always going to be behind current current gen devices or, you know, like anything that's in a big box that has giant heat sinks and direct wall power. So, yeah, it's going to be weaker, but it was totally fine at the time. Well, whatever, let's move on. Let me remind you that the Nintendo Switch is on par with the Wii U, which in turn is equipped... That's a lie. The Nintendo Switch is more powerful than a Wii U, but I digress. ...equivalent to a PlayStation 3 or a Xbox 360, that is two generations behind. And yeah, the Switch is slightly more powerful than the PlayStation 3 and Wii U. But let's be honest, most Switch games could easily run on a Wii U, even Tears of the Kingdom have no graphical improvements over Breath of the Wild. Sure, we can do the whole graphics debate, and actually the graphics are slightly better, but oh, uh, you're right. You could argue that Tears of the Kingdom looks very similar to Breath of the Wild graphically, not from uh, de the detail in terms of the level of detail distance, you know, the, how, how far away you can see the details. Also, not in terms of mechanics. The pure mechanics that are being done 
you know, with Ultra Hand and all that weren't possible to do on Wii U. So it's not true that Tears of the Kingdom could have been a Wii U title. It is doing things that required the extra processing and the extra RAM that the Wii U doesn't have. So, and this is true of a lot of Nintendo Switch titles, wouldn't just be able to just be ran on Wii U. Yes, you can argue your side-scrolling Kirby games or whatever could, but would Kirby in the Forgotten Land really run on that? It, it actually uses quite a bit of RAM, and RAM is really that big thing that you could look at Switch and go, man, that is way more RAM than the Wii U, way more RAM than the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360, let alone ex additional processing and you know a better GPUs. So it's sort of a misnomer to say everything on Switch could just run on Wii U. Like, it's not really... That's not really a factually accurate statement. And even worse, Nintendo just keeps porting Wii U games to the Switch. When they could have kept the Wii U going and released the Switch as a Wii U Pro or something like that. Okay, the Wii U was a failed system. You weren't going to continue the Wii U brand for starters, and that's one of the reasons why we actually got all these Wii U games ported over, because it just made sense. We couldn't do backwards compatibility because the Switch is a handheld with a cartridge slot. It can't fit full-size discs in it, of course, so you couldn't do you know native backwards compatibility. And then on top of that, because nobody played the Wii U, why would Nintendo just leave all their games on Wii U to die? Which, by the way, they didn't have that many games on Wii U. That was one of the problems. So they brought a majority of them over to Switch. They weren't going to call the Switch the Wii U Pro. Dude, the Wii U was a failed system. They And, and by the way, a Switch, the, the whole point of the brand name of Switch is that it switches from TV mode to handheld mode, even arguably to tabletop mode. So the branding's brilliant. You wouldn't call this a Wii U Pro. Again, the Wii U is using uh, PowerPC architecture. The Nintendo Switch is using ARM architecture, which is extremely modern, especially compared to what Nintendo's been using for decades. So, yeah, it's not that simple. This just shows a lack of knowledge, I suppose, on what's powering the Nintendo Switch. They could even name it Wii U Go. Oh, but now the generation is over, and Nintendo is about to release their next hardware. So let's try to imagine the possibilities. First, if Nintendo releases a portable console with the hardware on the same level as the PS4, that option will be quite challenging. Because not only most PS4 tier games are already available for a PC, and can easily run on a Steam Deck or ANEO 2, ANEO Air, in the future AYN Loki. But who would want to port their game to run a Nintendo's newest console? The funny thing is, almost every system he's mentioning and he's going to bring up the Steam Deck in a little bit, I believe, is basically as powerful as a PS4. So it's okay for them, but not but, but, but not Switch 2. It's a weird argument. I mean, if you want to play it, just get a Steam Deck. Not to mention that you can even run some PlayStation games on Steam Deck, and that definitely won't be available on a Switch 2 hardware. Well, yeah, of course, because PlayStation has brought some of their exclusives over to PC. Where, where this isn't a PC versus Nintendo debate. Like, they're not the same systems. Because you know what? The Nintendo Switch 2 will also have an entire library of games from Nintendo that are not being emulated on those systems and won't be able to be emulated on those systems. The Steam Deck really comes in right around the power level of a PlayStation 4. And while Nintendo's making games on their Switch 2 that uses that power, you're not going to be able to emulate those games cleanly on Steam Deck because emulation is a layer and it, it ends up not being able, just because the Steam Deck might have the raw power to technically run it, it's not running it native. So with that layer of emulation in there, ultimately Switch 2 games aren't going to be able to be emulated on the Steam Deck. Maybe on the Steam Deck 2, depending on how powerful that is. But again, the issue is not really emulation. It's, you know, how easy is the system hackable in order to dump the games? Because if you can't dump the games, then the emulation really doesn't matter. But yeah, of course, the PC has exclusive games too. The PC is a great system. I love PC gaming, but it doesn't replace Nintendo's output. Remember, Nintendo is outputting on average during the Nintendo Switch era. They are publishing quite literally nine games a year that is insane and that's nine games you're not going to get every single year on other platforms so I, I don't really understand that so unless you really want to play nintendo exclusives there is no reason for getting a switch too second option if nintendo releases a home console and try to compete with a ps5 and an xbox series x 
That again doesn't look very good. I doubt that Nintendo would have the same level of competence to make games on the same level as games made by Sony or Microsoft. What? Uh, the same level of competence? They do know that Tears of the Kingdom, well, they didn't know it at the time, obviously, but Tears of the Kingdom dropped this year at a 96 overall and is one of the leading contenders for Game of the Year. One of the uh, other games that, that's doing really out there, Bulgur's Gate 3, right, has a 94 on Metacritic. You know what also has a 94 this year on Metacritic? Metroid Prime Remaster. Uh, they have 297 overall games back in 2017 in Super Mario Odyssey and obviously Breath of the Wild. And Nintendo's just chock full of high 80s to high 90 plus games. I, I don't understand this whole competency thing. Nintendo's issue has never been their ability to create amazing games, no matter what the hardware is. So it's very weird to be like, oh man, if Nintendo had a system, if they made a traditional home console that was as powerful as a PS5, they wouldn't be competent enough to compete with... What are we talking about? I mean, at this point, it sounds like a hater who might be jealous of the IP and the sheer development capability of Nintendo, which is well beyond pretty much everyone else out there. And this isn't me slighting Sony or Microsoft or any of this stuff, but like competency, no one argues that some of the best developers in the world, which are at Nintendo, are competent game developers. That's yikes. After years making games for a weaker hardware, they are out of shape and definitely won't be able to handle a cutting edge hardware. Out of shape. What does out of shape mean? Oh, what? Do I <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, let's just continue. I don't know if I can even get through this video. And if you look at their rivals, the PS5 is already well established, and Sony is already working on exclusive titles. Uh, does he think this chart means anything? I mean, this date is obviously old and out of date. Because PS5 is now around 40 million and uh, Nintendo Switch is actually right, you know, just shy of 130 million. But does he think this chart, like, oh, look, look how, well, look, they're, they're well established. Like, okay, <laughs> yeah, duh. They've been out for a few years. I'm, I I don't really understand what, what that has to do with anything. Because guess what? This exact same argument existed when Switch came out in the first place. Yeah, the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One were also well established. And look what the Switch did. Like, them being well-established, they don't do what Switch does. They just don't. So, uh, it, it, these aren't replacements for a Switch 2, you know what I mean? They will really need to step up their game if they go with this option. And that leaves us to the final possibility. Nintendo could release another gimmicky console to set them apart from any possible competition. Like they did with the Wii, Wii U, and the Switch, they will have to bring something new to the table. What will it be? I have no idea. Maybe a VR console with display on glasses, like the Viture, or... Okay, we're gonna kind of skip past this because he, he talks about this one idea and that it's not going to work or whatever, so we're gonna skip a little bit. It, uh, look, he, they're not doing this, so that's not really a problem. We already know, based on dev kits, that it's going to end up... You know, he didn't have this information at the time but that it's going to be another Switch-like console. doesn't mean there won't be some gimmicky features, but they're not going to include, like, these Vitra glasses, right? They're, they're, these things are, like, 500 bucks a pop, 1000 bucks to get running. Like, these are not a realistic option that Nintendo is going to be considering. Think about it. You could have skipped the Wii U entirely and bought the Switch in the end, and you would be able to catch up because most of the Wii U games are available on the Switch, with enhancements, too. Another point is that they lost the perfect time frame to release a new console, which is the release of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Bro oh, okay, so before we get to the Tears of the Kingdom point, I'm going to let him finish. I, I want to point out that, yeah, you are just you just made an excellent selling point for why people should buy Switch, because there's a lot of games there. Breath of the Wild was a huge selling point for the Switch, and followed by Mario Odyssey, it was the perfect kickstart for a console. But Tears... Are you forgetting the Mario Kart 8 Deluxe port that actually outsold you know, Mario Odyssey and, 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 and Breath of the Wild combined? That also... <laughs> Look, that first year was insane. And uh, yeah, Mario and Zelda were a big reason. So was Mario Kart. So was Splatoon 2. So was Xenoblade Chronicles. So was Mario plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle. So was a lot. Like, I haven't even... Fire Emblem Warriors. Like, that first year was insane. So, okay. But just because it won't have a brand new Zelda in year one... 
I don't know that that suddenly means the system can't succeed. Tears of the Kingdom will be released in a few weeks, and there is no signs of a new console. So unless Nintendo is making something huge, like a sequel to Smash Ultimate, which I highly doubt this can happen, the Switch will have a weak launch. To be honest... Um, the, the, okay. They're not gonna have a Super Smash Bros. Ultimate sequel ready to go at launch. They're gonna have a 3D Mario game! A 3D Mario game! What are we talking about a weak launch? 3D Mario, they haven't launched a system with 3D Mario since the Nintendo 64. What are we talking about? Honest, I grew tired of Nintendo. In the past, Nintendo was always a brand of high quality. They always pushed for innovation, but at the same time, they brought cutting-edge technology to their consoles. The 64 only failed because they opted for car- Alright, so he's gonna get to some opinions on why certain systems failed, and other ones were successful, and... I'm, I'm gonna, just going to point out that Nintendo's most successful systems have actually always been their handhelds. Uh, there's been a, a pretty big consistency in sales of the Game Boy, the Game Boy Advance, the DS, and the 3DS. Those systems have always been the best-selling systems for Nintendo. Even when the Wii was doing its 100 million plus thing, the DS topped that and did 150 million. So Nintendo's bread and butter have actually always been their handhelds, not their home consoles. But, uh, you know, it's, it's fine. We can debate about why Nintendo's hardware didn't do good or did do good. He's going to talk about the N64. He's going to go probably into the GameCube mini discs. Then, I don't know, maybe that the Wii was a gimmick and they abandoned. It's funny because he talked about hardware innovation. I mean, I don't think anyone can argue the, the Wii wasn't an innovative console. But anyways. Cartridges in an era where CDs were the future and they repeated the same mistake on the GameCube, opting for mini DVDs that in the end limited the space of the games, resulting in more cost for the developers by having to add a second disc to the package. When they released the Wii... Uh, to be fair, during this era of like PlayStation 2 and game... Well, uh, there were games on PlayStation 2 that had multiple discs. Like that was... It, it was the multiple discs in the package were... Uh, not uncommon back then on all systems. So I, I just want to point that out that it really wasn't that it was multiple discs. Yes, the mini disc was a mistake and there were some limitations to it, including how much you could put on a disc. But uh, it was pretty common back then that several games you would have to you know switch the disc. That, that, that wasn't a new concept because of GameCube. It's like they gave up. Just make a new gimmick and try to sell a console around that. What I find interesting here is he, he's talking about Wii and he says, you know, they just made a new gimmick and they gave up. And yet what he talked about before is that Nintendo's always been innovative, not only in their games, but also in the hardware space. And then one of the most innovative consoles of all time is now being called a gimmick. When we can actually literally look at it today and in hindsight, motion controls are not a gimmick. And here's how we know that motion controls are not a gimmick. They are now featured in some form on every single system for the most part. Xbox is sort of not really going all in on it anymore, but obviously they did the Kinect and we have the PlayStation Move, but we've now seen you know, we have full range of motion controls in the PlayStation 5 controller. We have, obviously, motion controls still there on Nintendo Switch and the Joy-Cons. We have motion controls going on in VR. Motion controls were clearly not a gimmick because a gimmick is something that it doesn't stick. It is a temporary selling point for something that ends up not becoming mainstream. And in the end, motion controls have become mainstream. They just have. So we can't sit there in hindsight looking back at Wii and calling it a gimmick when it's quote-unquote gimmick is now a mainstream thing. You know, the, the iPhone doing what it did in its original launch was a gimmick, but no one goes back and looks at that as a gimmick today because it became an industry standard. So, yeah, it, look, at the time it was a gimmick because it was a fresh idea that no one was really doing, but then it caught on. And because it caught on, it's no longer a gimmick. So we can't... You, you can't look back at that and call it bad. You know, you have all these motion games. Of VR. You can look at all this stuff today and thank the Wii for popularizing motion controls. It's very cool at first, but after a while it gets stale and people will move to other consoles. Third-party companies will either downgrade and release poorly optimized games or not release their games on Nintendo platforms anymore. And without powerful hardware, their games get easily emulated. I won't be surprised if their next console gets an emulator two years after release. 
All right. I just want to say that when a console gets an emulator, it has nothing to do with the power of the system. PlayStation 5 has emulators right now. Xbox Series X has emulators right now. Um, and they, these emulators have been around for a year and a half to two years, which if you look back at that, that means they existed within a year of the system. Emulators always exist pretty rapidly after a system comes out. It's got nothing to do with the power. What, what makes the emulators popular or not are the ability to dump the games. And a, a Switch's issue was it was so easy to hack those first generation Switches. It became stupidly easy to dump games. If it had been much more difficult, it probably would have took two to three years before game dumps would be rapidly popular. And then, you know, then that's when emulation would take off. It's nothing to do with when emulators are created. Again, there are PlayStation 5 emulators today that can play PlayStation 5 ROMs. So this just doesn't necessarily make that much sense. That being said, I, I don't really get his point in this. He's just arguing that, hey, people are going to break the law. Yeah, and <laughs> that's how to make up a majority of the consumer base. In the end, I think that the best option for Nintendo today is to go third party like Sega. They will make way more money if they release their games to all consoles, and players too will benefit from that by not... Uh, so this third party argument, I think Nintendo would do very well as a third party publisher, but didn't he just earlier say Nintendo can't make games on par with PlayStation and Xbox? Remember, his own argument was saying if Nintendo released a box, a TV, a traditional console as powerful as PlayStation 5, they would still fail because they can't make games on par. But now he's saying, oh, but if they were third party, magically they can now make games on par. That makes no sense. It makes no sense. It, the, the arguments defeat each other. They either can make games on powerful hardware and make them awesome and amazing and sell and sell and sell, or they can't. You can't say, let's go third party. I'm having to buy a console just mm. to play Nintendo exclusives. Yeah, Nintendo's been doing that for a long time. Also, no one stopped them from selling handhelds. Their worst selling handheld system sold 75 million. I'm just saying, Nintendo knows what they're doing. And that's it for this video. What All right, so that's kind of where he ends it. Thank you so much, man. We're going to move on to this other video. And I want to give a note to this one. These guys at Hard for Games are not uh, people. They, they really like Switch. They like Switch a lot. They, they definitely are seem a lot more knowledgeable than the other YouTuber on this. And obviously, this video is much more recent. It was posted yesterday. And, you know, they're a, a slightly bigger channel, about 93,000 subscribers. But uh, I skipped that bit ahead here because they had a lot of discussion points talking about you know the rumors on switch 2 and everything um so this is all like sort of like why was the switch successful why wasn't the wii u successful etc and this sort of seems to be when the criticism begins because again you see the title nintendo will screw up not will it screw up or will they screw up or it may they're claiming in their title that nintendo is going to screw up their next generation console so let's respond to these guys as well and I know it's a lengthier video than usual, but hey, this is what I want to see if you guys are interested in this type of content. Very based. Now, of course, we hope the next gen Nintendo system doesn't fail, but here's see, how I told we you think they like it, it will. One of the things that I was thinking about when I was doing uh, some brainstorming for this episode is that I realized Nintendo never really has released two consoles successfully in a row, with the exception of the NES and SNES. All right, so one. Even the, even the SNES sold worse, but then there was also the Genesis at the time. Of course, there was competition for the NES as well. People forget there was actually more competition for the NES than there was for the SNES. It just so happened that obviously, you know, the Genesis was really, really popular. But one thing I will note here is he's talking, you know, when he says Nintendo's never done it back to back, just the, the, the SNES and the NES, you forget their handhelds. Game Boy and Game Boy Advance were both back-to-back -back 80 million plus sellers. And then the DS was a 150 million. And while the 3DS came in at 75 million, and that's still not that far off from what the Game Boy and Game Boy Advance did. Uh, and so I'm just pointing out that, uh, yeah, they've been able to release back-to-back-to-back-to-back. -to -back -to -back -to -back. Now, to back successful platforms just in the handheld space. And we can't forget that Switch exists in that space. And like the the NES was insane, especially mm -hmm. for the time. And then the Super Nintendo still did well. Yeah, but you could tell it was a lot more split with the Genesis. Mm -hmm. But the 64 did not do that well. It did not sell well at all. 
Um, the GameCube did not sell well at all. No, the GameCube was pretty bad. The Wii did. Ooh. The Wii U didn't. So yeah. Post the SNES, it's never had two like good selling, well selling systems in a row. Yeah. So for some reason, they just seem to not be <laughs> to like the not be able to do it. Helps. Well, yes, we're talking about like consoles. I know yeah. this is a hybrid, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that's part of the reason it, it was it was so stable is I think going with that hybrid handheld thing. Yeah. Hey, look at that. They brought up the handhelds and they're mentioning that you know what? We can't forget about the handhelds. They actually have been pretty stable with handhelds. So credit to them. As I said, they're way more knowledgeable, I think, than that other channel. Also, to to note you know, Furukawa himself has talked about it, how we, how Nintendo gets really high and then they fall off a cliff and how he wants to prevent that from happening. So definitely this concern about Nintendo's massive sways in the market is something Nintendo is aware of and definitely is something that, you know, this might be one of those points they're making that at least shows, look, we looked at the history of Nintendo and yeah, sometimes it, it they, they kind of fall on their face after they have a lot of success. Yeah. When I used to drive for Uber and Lyft, I put in hours and hours and hours in between fares. You mean playing. while you were driving? Yeah, while I was driving, yeah. and they'd be screaming at me to put my eyes in the road. But you'd be playing just... a racing game, and technically you were. Yeah, it'd be okay. like, shut up. I think, I think he's being sarcastic here. You don't play Switch <laughs> while driving. Yeah, I might have um, hit three people. I, again, we talked about power. Bottom. And you know that they're not going to do a full step up in power. It's not going to be like a PS5. They're going to go from the Switch to the successor, the current generation ps5 etc is up here they need to I, I need i think they need to chase that a little bit more they don't have to reach it but i feel like their jump in power isn't going to be enough so to get close to the playstation 5 in terms of power in a portable system which by the way none of these portable pc platforms are close to playstation 5 either would require something that costs a lot of money like 1500 two thousand dollars to do and it would be quite beefy and it would have really crappy battery life so in the end it's going to be probably much closer to playstation 4 if not a little bit better than playstation 4 maybe close to playstation 4 pro so I, I don't really know that that's going to be a problem because to argue that's a problem is to say the Switch's power is a problem. And as much as you might deride, oh, the Switch's ability to get competent ports, here's the bottom line. The Switch is significantly less powerful than a PlayStation 4, and yet it is significantly outselling the PlayStation 4. So we do need to look at this from an objective viewpoint that it was okay to do it with Switch, so now we can't do it with Switch 2? The, I don't think that logic really lines up because it's ignoring that that's exactly what they just did. Why wouldn't they do that again? It makes a lot of sense. You don't need to be nipping at the PlayStation 5's power in order to get high-quality third-party ports and also to obviously get high-quality Nintendo games. I feel like it's not going to be enough to sustain them. They're yeah. going to deal with this issue again in a number of years. I feel like it's putting a Band-Aid on it. So it's not really a band aid, it's just what Nintendo does. They make hand it's a handheld system. Handheld systems can't be expected to be as powerful as boxes, but handheld systems have a lot of appeal on their own because they're handheld. Nintendo knows this because they've been doing it since the 80s. What I would personally like out of the next Switch would be more of a focus on frame rate, which I know that the average reviewer will probably actually be like, these games don't look good. If it was people still sort of playing to the more minimalist graphics, like the actual way in which say like Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom work is actually fairly clever in sort of like a minimalist, somewhat cell shaded sort of thing. Yeah. But if you could try and play to that, but have everything more fluid, that would be what I would want. Yep. But every reviewer is going to be like, doesn't look photorealistic enough, dude. Uh, that's... Look, Mario Odyssey is a 97. Reviewers aren't as knocking of visuals. I, I think this is more of a, a, a statement on like gamers in general. There'll be a lot of gamers online that to this day will knock Nintendo games for looking too kiddy. But reviewers actually are a lot more fair about the visual art styles of games and don't usually hold that against the games unless the art style doesn't work. Tears of the Kingdom is a damn 96, and it doesn't look even close to photorealistic. So I, I, I think you need to shift the reviewers, we'll say, to certain gamers that enjoy other platforms, we'll say. And you can't get involved in fanboy wars like that. 
So next up, I think one of the biggest things that people are thinking about is whether or not it'll have backwards compatibility. And there's a couple different ways in which it could have backwards compatibility. Yeah. A couple different combinations of ways. Obviously there's the cartridges, but there's also the online games, yeah. the eShop, the online service, yeah. right? There's a couple different ways that it could interact. But I feel like it may not have the backwards compatibility. I hope it does. I feel like it would be a huge slap. It... So yeah, I mean, look, <laughs> the backwards compatibility point's been sort of beaten to death at this point. It's kind of anti-consumer if you don't have it, but also Nintendo's handheld-wise, they've done it every single time. Home console-wise, they haven't always. They've done it a few generations. But, you know, handheld-wise, they've always had one generation of backwards compatibility. We could see that again. We just don't know for sure. It's not a for sure thing. And I, I will agree that if it doesn't have it, I don't think it kills the platform, but it definitely could hurt the interest in it at launch because it's going to have to build up a library of games, whereas it could rely on the Switch's library plus a new library of games. So, yeah, if there is something to be said about backwards compatibility, and, hey, for now it's not guaranteed, so I, it's a valid concern. Would in the be, face <laughs> if it doesn't. I think that would be insane for them not to do it. The mechanism for reading a cartridge is very cheap. Yeah. I think because it's so cheap to have a card reader, if they did do a new format of card, mm -hmm. I don't think it would be impossible for them to do just two ports. Oh. Yes, yeah, so they could do two ports. Also, they can make the port cross compatible. I've been digging into a little bit when I talked about the 3D NAND, and it doesn't look like they'd have to redo the pin layout for reading. So if they can use the same pin layout, all they'd have to do is make sure that people aren't plugging Switch 2 cartridges into their Nintendo Switch to make sure there's a differentiator. They actually did this with the 3DS, where the DS cartridges and the 3DS cartridges actually have very similar pin layouts. And because of that, all they did is throw a little notch on the 3DS cartridges so people won't stick them in their DS cartridges, but you could literally take DS games and stick it in your 3DS cartridge slot. So it is entirely possible that they could have a universal cartridge slot as well, or they could obviously go with the two slot method they're talking about. I feel like it's just cleaner to go with one but we'll see if nintendo supports physical backwards compatibility that's also another concern some have that if they do do backwards compatibility it'll be digital games only and i mean that to me is like a band-aid just to not support your physical cartridges okay totally it's, it's totally it's, game .com it. It, yeah, game yeah. Comment. <laughs> yeah like, <laughs> or, or nintendo um, ds i should have said that i mean they already um, have an sd and that so there's a couple different ways in which the switch could be backwards compatible we talked hmm. about the uh, cartridges, uh, but there's also <laughs> lotto ticket. <laughs> hey, someone won the mega millions yesterday. So congrats on becoming a millionaire. <laughs> so the eShop and of course the online service that you pay $20 a year for. Yeah. So to back up your games, you need to have the online service. So that would need to be compatible with the new console if they were backward compatible. So that would have to be the same online service or at least have an overlap there. Well, they did mention they're bringing Nintendo accounts forward. I know that's not technically NSO. People assume it's NSO, but that graph from 2021 just says Nintendo accounts. And guess what? Nintendo accounts are on your phone as well. And the NSO is not on your phone. So I'm just pointing out that, you know, when looking at this, bit, people argue, well, the Nintendo online app is on there and that is NSO. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I get it. But yeah, I'm just going to point out that this doesn't necessarily mean NSO is uh, forwards compatible, but a lot of us assume it will be because it's a subscription service. Duh, they're not going to want to end that. So I think another thing that could possibly ruin the next console is a gimmick gone wrong. Now, Nintendo always has their gimmicks, especially in the last couple of years. Obviously, the Wii has the motion controls, the Wii U, the little gamepad thing, the Switch. It's a hybrid console with sort of, like we mentioned, features of those previous consoles, what are they going to do next? But And will it be too confusing or just fall flat? Will they sacrifice power, which is what they need, for some gimmick that nobody actually wants? One thing to note is that the Switch actually had multiple gimmicks. You know, we mostly just talk about the versatility, but one of the gimmicks that completely fell flat was that sort of like haptic feedback with the controller. It's interesting because HD Rumble, I don't think, fell flat. And 
Like, it's funny because HD Rumble really wasn't a new feature. So they actually use a very similar technology to what is used inside of mobile devices because the Joy-Cons were so thin you couldn't use traditional Rumble motors. So they're actually using like the same actuators that are inside phones. And what's cool about those actuators is that it uses sound frequencies to create different levels of... Um, you know, buzzing and all of that. And you can actually get pretty realistic, but there are some limitations to that. So they, they did what Nintendo should do and act like it's a new feature because it, it can do some stuff the old Rumble Motors can, but it's also not necessarily something that a lot of developers obviously chose to use. Also, I think the one, if you really want to talk about falling flat was the IR camera. That has basically barely been touched. There are some games that do use HD Rumble even to this day, but it clearly wasn't a feature Nintendo cared that much about using. They just kind of use it as like a traditional Rumble. So it is what it is. Uh, we'll just have to, you know, move on. You know, Nintendo's going to have a gimmick. There's going to be something, but just like the 3D and the 3DS, if it doesn't work, it doesn't also have to be a killer. Uh, it could just be something that's optional. And Nintendo's been actually doing more of these optional gimmicks while having a base selling reason of, hey, this is a really great console without this, but we have this in case it takes off. And they've really done that since Wii, and I like that they're doing that. Like, hey, we have the gamepad, but do you want to use Wiimotes? You can use the Wiimotes again on Wii U, right? I know the Wii U flopped, but the point is that all their gimmicks have been optional gimmicks, and I like that they're optional. And I think that that's why we don't need to worry about it with Switch 2 because whatever it is, let's say they put a camera and that's and they're doing AR things. You don't want to do AR. You can just ignore that the camera's even there. Like it was like a sort of a, a smart vibration. I can't remember it, what exactly they what they called it. Rum, HD rumble. HD rumble. Yeah. yeah. It yeah. felt great and no one used it. Yeah. So they did that one two switch the party game. Yeah. And everyone it felt was like, great with it was like, oh, this is cool. You'd be trying to figure out how but, many dice were in the cup, and it felt like you were holding a cup with dice. But in it. nobody cared after that. <laughs> Imagine if the switch when the switch came out. Instead of Breath of the Wild and like One Two Switch and like Bomberman, whatever, it oh, had like okay, it okay. had like four or five games that just hyper focused on the HD Rumble, okay, a feature that nobody cared about. Okay, that would yeah, have yeah. partially killed the Switch's momentum at the. Right, we're gonna kind of skip ahead because I I already sort of responded to this stuff, so it's uh, all in on the IR sensor. Or it's like whatever it happens to be. <laughs> hey, at least they like, mentioned I feel it. Like that could possibly a bad gimmick could possibly kill it. Like so, for example, remember how hard Shigeru Miyamoto wanted those motion control doubles. To be fair, Nintendo was sort of nudging him, hey, because Wii U is his idea. They were sort of nudging him that he needed to prove the concept of Wii U because people weren't understanding it. Much to my dismay in, Fo in Star Fox Zero. Screen thing in full Nintendo again. <laughs> Slightly tangential. I want to get to their next point. Is the fact that Nintendo always kind of falls back to its old ways and rests on its laurels. When it has a very successful console, they want to do a successor to that console. So you have the NES, then you have the Super NES, and then, you know, SNES didn't sell as well, or what have you, or whatever, yeah. they run a new direction, N64, GameCube, then they have the Wii, and then they're like, the Wii was sold like hotcakes, yeah. Wii U. So are they gonna do some sort of naming convention with this thing? that confuses the audience now this okay this is a concern because nintendo has done some wacky naming conventions they've also done some that have worked like game boy game boy advance i would say game boy advance was a pretty good name because it lets you know that this isn't a traditional game boy it's an advanced version of a game boy which tells you that it must there must be something new about it there must be something more powerful about it uh, you know, the DS, the 3DS, I think they thought they were being really, really clever with the whole 3D thing. And obviously that part ended up not being as big of a selling point as they thought, although it all it was impressive from a technological standpoint at that given time because there really weren't glasses-free 3D devices just readily available at that price range. But yeah, look, they've obviously done some weird naming conventions over the years. I don't know that calling it a Super Switch is really the way to go or calling it a Switch Advance. I clearly think they, they need to stick with something that's just more easily understood by all consumers. Just call it a Switch 2. But yeah, it, it's going to be a concern. Nintendo does have a different president in charge, though, that might realize that, hey, we can't be, like, super uber weird with this name. But it, it is 
I, I will give them this. I don't know if it'll make the system flop, but it is a concern that they might brand this in a very weird way. Yeah, I, I also feel like every time somebody's had a real big hit, they get cocky. You know, they'll have to be really, really clever with what they call it if they include Switch in the name at all. I don't. I honestly don't think they will, but... Uh, the thing is, I don't think they have to be that clever. It just call it a Switch 2. If they do, they'll have to be very clever about it because people might just think it's a Switch Pro. Yeah. Rest in peace. Switch or Pro, like Switch a, DX. Yeah, or like a Switch OLED or something like that. We'll, we'll call it the Switch is. S and the Switch X. Yeah. No, <laughs> Xbox <laughs> joke. Um, but it's a, it's a new system. It's a new system. Well, you know, the thing is, too, like with Xbox, they could kind of get away with that because Xbox fans were still playing Xbox and paying attention to what Microsoft was doing with it. With Look, the branding of the Xbox Series system is not good. Can we just... Can we just be honest? You literally came off the Xbox One X and then released the Xbox Series X. I'm just saying that. M M Phil Spencer, you made you made you made uh, <laughs> you you pulled an Elon Musk. You love the X too much. <laughs> With the Wii U, a lot of Nintendo fans had dropped off in that big lull. Yeah. With the Wii, while it wasn't selling well and gone either handheld with Nintendo or to other consoles, so they weren't really paying attention to what Nintendo was doing. Yeah, yeah. People come out with the Wii U, and then it's there's a disconnect because you, you you're not like you're no longer on the conversation. Yeah. It's like you're jumping back in. Wii U, wait, what is that? So that is all we have for today. But let us know in the comments below. All right. Well, you know this isn't that bad, and I gotta say that that second video obviously it was a bit more tolerable because these people were way more knowledgeable on Nintendo, I think, than that first video, which felt more like a fanboy hating on Nintendo. But I don't know. Look, you guys let me know what you think about this kind of video. Obviously, super long, but I wanted to make sure that when I'm doing these reaction videos, I'm adding enough commentary, enough originality to it. I just don't want to jack people's content. I think that that's just a super crappy thing that some content creators think is okay, apparently. Uh, but not me. I, I want to make sure I'm adding my own original thoughts and twists and analyzing all this stuff so thank you guys so much for tuning in let me know what you think about this and i'll catch you in the next video